This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me for another installment of the show. This one features a chat with CJ Ramon. CJ is now doing time with Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, which is the catalyst for this conversation. The group is touring Australia in February 2023. I won't read out the dates because fuck all people listen to my show who live in Australia. Oh, the irony. Anyway, I enjoyed this conversation. It wasn't nearly long enough, so maybe down the road, CJ and I will reconnect and a much longer chat will occur in which we'll dive into a myriad of aspects from throughout his career. Either way, I'm not even going to play any music. Let's just go right into it. Here he is, CJ Ramone. How's it going? Hey, mate. How are you? Okay. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late there. Never a drummer, brother. Never a drummer at all, mate. I just appreciate you make yourself available for these these phoners or Zoomers, as we've got to call them these days. All right. I'm <laughs> uh, I'm still getting used to all of this stuff, so believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that right? Is it a relatively new thing for you to do a lot of this sort of, uh, you know, m- meet the uh, indie journo type things? Well, I, I just uh, the – the whole thing of zoom meetings and all of that stuff. It's just, you know, I, and, and not that I haven't done a whole bunch of them, but every time I have to do one, it's like, I have to relearn how, <laughs> how to operate everything. And then of course I try to sign on and it said, uh, you know, you have to update your zoom oh. settings and all that stuff. So yeah. yeah I'm hearing you. Yeah. Hey, you uh, are you a Jets fan or a Giants fan over there? I am a Buffalo Bills fan, brother. Oh, Jets right. and the Giants, the Jets and the Giants play in New Jersey. Yes, Buffalo's the only team that plays in New York. I used to be a Jets fan when I was a kid. In fact, they uh, they practiced at Hofstra University, which was right across the street from my father's favorite watering hole. So mm. he used to leave me at the field, and I would watch them practice. And when they got done, I'd walk over to the bar and and meet them there. Cool, but yeah, oh. big big Jets fan for a lot of years, but. After, uh, you know, after they couldn't get the whole thing down with New York and the stadium and everything mm. and they stopped playing in New York, I became a, a Buffalo Bills fan. Is it just a logistical issue and it's, is it cheaper for them to play out of MetLife? Is that is that the reason that they're in New, New Jersey? I, I, if I remember correctly, they wanted New York State to build the build the stadium. They wanted help from the state um, yeah. to build a stadium and um, they just couldn't come to turn. They couldn't come to terms. And uh I think they were playing at Shea uh, Stadium, yeah. City, now yeah. City Field. Um, but uh, yeah, I think New York State told them to hit the bricks, and New Jersey said, "Hey, we'll build you a nice new, you know, we'll build we'll build a complex." And the Jets and the Giants both play mm. uh, at that complex. You know, all these years, you know, considering football is the biggest sport in America, I mean. Yeah. Personally, I'm a bigger baseball fan uh, than I am a football fan. But considering um, the revenue it generates and everything else, New York State really made a huge mistake in um, in in not building them a stadium for both teams. You know, they, there's myriad of of ways and places it could have been done. But I at that time period, New York State was uh, uh, <laughs> not not doing great financially. So. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask you what you thought of Zach Wilson. Oh, I'm a Jets fan, you see. So he did pretty well against uh, the Buffalo Bills, but um, yesterday yeah. he wasn't too crash hot. Yeah, yeah. Um, who we played? We played the Browns yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. We played the Browns. We beat them 31. I I thought we would have put a bunch more points up on the board against the Browns, considering they're three and Browns are three and seven, but um. A win is a win. <laughs> yeah, you'll take it. You'll take a win any time, won't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Hey, look. Look. In regards to the tour, uh, you are coming down here. It is a very expansive tour with me first and the Gimme Gimmies, and yeah. you're playing. You're playing a, a lot of regional centres in addition to the major cities. So, yeah. is this a? Are you treating this as a bit of a holiday as well? Um, I actually considered flying my wife and my daughter over at mm. the end of the tour, my youngest one, um, because I've always uh, always had a kind of a special place for Australia. And I mean, uh, you know, 
there's a lot of great places in the world, but Australia and New Zealand is absolutely two of my favorite places to travel to. Um, awesome. out, you know, and that, and that's outside of the music scene and everything else, just because I, I dig the culture. I just love the culture. Mm-hmm. I really, I, I've always had a good time going, uh, going down that way. Um, uh, in fact, I'm into motorcycling. So one of my, uh, one of my dream rides is to, is to circumnavigate the, the continent. Nice. Um, at some point in my life, I, I'd like to get that done. So, but yeah, I, um, when I toured with my own band, I did my retirement tour in 2019 of, you know, retired from playing my own shows. Um, and, and I planned it out so that we would end in Australia and we ended up, uh, at the end of the tour, we rented a um, a little house in Perth uh, nice. for a week, just me and my me and my band, and we spent a week just relaxing and hanging out and having drinks and reminiscing. And but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice work. Well, I, yeah. I, I always try to hit some of the smaller places. Like when we were, uh, I was going over the schedule with um, I think it was uh Pinch, our drummer, and he was like Wollongong. I was like, You've never been to Wollongong? <laughs> He's like, No, I was like, dude, I was like, you get you're in for a treat. So um I yeah, I I enjoy hitting some of the out of out of the way places and in general, no matter what country you're in, it, those out of the way places, um the fans are a bit more appreciative because not every band comes through. And uh and that's so that was always kind of my angle when I go out, went out on tour was to make sure that I, I got to some of those places that not everybody gets to. I mean, these days it's different. You know, a lot of bands get to a lot of places and especially post, you know, lockdown and everything. Everyone is, there's so many bands out on tour at one time that it's hard to find dates that don't conflict with other bands in the town that you want to play in on the dates that you're getting there. So I think probably in general, um, a lot of the smaller towns will will be better served uh, going forward because everyone wants to be on tour trying to make up for two years of no income. So I think you're right. Yeah, pre-COVID, it was a bit silly. We had like two or three killer bands come through every week. And yeah. when, I, when I was a kid, you were lucky to get two or three killer bands a bloody year in the 90s. Yeah. You know, and but the scene's just been broken wide open in that respect. So, yeah, I, it was definitely noticed by people that you have this uh, – you have all of these regional dates, but um, that's yeah. in, that's interesting. You mentioned you, you retired from touring with your own band. I didn't didn't know that. So you can sing. There's no doubt about that. I actually like your singing as much as I like your bass playing. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> I, I, I do both as well. You see, so I can I know okay. where you're coming from with it. So I know it can be bloody hard at times. You know. Yeah. But yeah, it's a um. Yeah. Uh, it was uh. I just got to the point 2019. I mean, I had been, you know, at that point I had four records out on my own. You know, I put four records out on fat records. Mm -hmm. Um, I was working, you know, with one of the best punk rock uh, booking agents in the, in the United States. Uh, I'd been doing everything right for so long and touring hard too uh, for 10 years, uh, you know, as CJ Ramon and, uh, you know, and including Ramon songs in the set, you know, people come to a CJ Ramon show. They want to hear Ramon songs also. But um, I just got to the point where um, I could see that the crowds were thinning. Um, and I was on the road so much that it re- I, I really was started to have some serious health issues um, from being on the road, um, you know, re- related to a lot of different things, uh, you know, the 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 least of which, um, you know, <laughs> excessive alcohol consumption when I was on the road. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, it it just got really hard to, to continue to, you know, be the bass player and the singer and the songwriter and the business manager and the head bean counter and bottle washer. And I was just wearing so many hats for so long. I just got to the point where um, it was really taking a toll on me physically and uh, and I just made the command decision. I was like, I, I need to I need to get off the road and and um and get spend some time on myself. And realistically, I did it at the best time possible. You know, the I I did my final tour in Australia, hmm. November two thousand nineteen, March twenty twenty. The lockdown happens. 
which allowed me to lose a bunch of weight and start eating good and go hiking in the hills. I live out in California now. I'm in the East Bay. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Cisco. Yeah. So yeah. hiking in the hills and just living a healthier lifestyle and really got myself straightened out. Um, and the gimmies came along and I had done some stuff with them and they were like, Hey, you know, would you be willing to be, you know, full-time bass player in the band? And I said, I absolutely would love to. Okay. That makes sense. You've answered a bunch of questions or a few questions in there that I, uh, might've yeah. had, but, uh, it's a, is- it's a bit, it's a lot different actually. <laughs> I mean, with my band, I was touring in a van. I was doing a fair amount of the driving, loading and unloading my own gear every night. You know, it was a real DIY punk rock situation. Um, with the gimmies, I ride on a tour bus. I have a tech, you know, I can lay in bed all day, get up a sound check and lay back down and then get up for the show. Um, I've gotten a real handle on my uh, on my alcohol consumption. And I, you know, I've been able to maintain a he- healthy lifestyle because I'm not having to do everything and, and deal with the stress of all of it. So, you know, for it's a g- great retirement job. That's the way best way for me to put it. And then the gimme stone tour um, uh, as many dates as I was doing with my own thing. Well, you, you've paid your dues. You, you don't owe anybody anything at this point in time. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, do you feel pressure to play Ramon songs within the set? No, 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 no. I, you know, I, I really worked hard to kind of represent and uh, the Ramones and keep the legacy going for for a good long time. You know, past when they were retired. You know. Um, when we were retired and uh um i it just got to the point like i said you know i started to notice the crowd standing out and and um and uh, i was just so beat up i i was like okay yeah i gotta tap i gotta tap out at this point i could have you know i probably could have taken the lockdown off and then come back out but i announced that i was retiring and did a full retirement tour and um uh, you know, so the way that I left it, you know, the, my understanding with uh, with the Ramones crowd, I think, is is that if there's an offer to do something good, I'll get out there and do it. But I'm not getting in a van and hammering out shows and and stuff anymore. That's just yeah. I can't do that anymore. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I'm happy. I'm happy doing what I'm doing with the gimmies. I play behind a great front man who, you know, not only a great front man, but a, a really great singer. Um, I never enjoyed being a front man or a singer. Never liked it. I did really? it only because I, you know, it's just, who, who am I going to get to stand up and sing Joey Ramone songs? You know what I mean? There's no, that would be, um, that would be like a Ramones cover band, you know? And that's why I, uh, I, I, did all the singing and and once i started writing my own songs it was weird to hand my lyrics and my experiences and stuff over to somebody else to sing about and so i kind of sang by default kind of like in the ramones you know i became you know i i took over a a fair amount of singing in the ramones Mm. out of necessity more than out of uh ability (laughs) i i I don't disagree slightly on that last point i think you've got a magnificent voice uh Thank it's, you. I appreciate that. No, I like it. It's uh, I've, I've watched the Rock Palast live footage on YouTube a lot, actually, a few times. And oh, yeah. I actually draw, I'll give you this feedback, I actually draw inspiration from you because ah, I play covers, right? So a bit, bit like we're both doing the same thing. You on a much grander scale than me, but I play it every weekend these days. We're back into playing every weekend post-COVID and I've got to sing a few songs. And yeah. um, I... I play up like this because I play a lot of you know funk, jazz, disco. Right, you're playing oh, cool. everything. All right. you know, playing you can play every. You know, one song will be September by Earth, Wind, and Fire, and the next one will be Highway to Hell by ACDC. So yeah, I've got to sort of know my way around everything. But I'll, I'll provide a lot of the backing vocals, uh, and um, I, I look forward to the day that I can do a full on lead vocal. I can do things like Jimmy Eat World, uh, the middle, this sort of thing. But I've watched I've watched your performance and the way in which you breathe. It's the things yeah. people won't notice. It's your breathing in between the cadence of the beat. And I've yeah. thought, okay, that's how you're doing it. Okay, I can d- adopt some of that. Your your bass is a bit lower than the way I handle mine, but I can right. still adopt characteristics of it. So you've actually helped me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, the breathing thing is, um, uh, you know, playing at the, um, uh, at the tempo, 
But I, in general, I, I'm very physical on stage. I'm really physical. And that's always kind of how I've explained, you know, people like, you, you know, you got so much energy on stage, blah, blah. And, you know, I always tell everybody like, you know, what what I do on stage and and like as aggressive as I am in my playing, I mean, that's just a physical expression Right. That's when you're playing and and singing and and jumping around and everything. That's a physical expression of 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 the feeling that you get from doing what you're doing. You know, what I mean, it, 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 like being on stage in front of people and playing songs that you really love. And, you know, to to get up on stage and be, and, you know, just stand at the microphone and and just sing. I, I, I can't I don't have. I guess I just don't have enough control, <laughs> enough control over my um, uh, over myself to to do that, to stand at the microphone and sing pitch pe perfect and, you know, and play perfectly. I can't do that. You know what I mean? For me, it's a, a physical expression of of how I feel when I'm on stage and how I feel about the music and the lyrics. And that's why I, I, I was so aggressive when I played, you know, people mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, you're down picking blah, blah. I'm like. That's just pure adrenaline. Like I could not, I couldn't play that speed at a, at rehearsal. You know what I mean? At rehearsal, when we rehearse, you know, usually everything's, you know, a beat of two per minute slower than, than what we actually do live. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because live, your adrenaline takes over. And once my adrenaline kicks in, that's it. I am on strictly on autopilot. A lot of the things that I do are so, um, spontaneous you know sp and not spontaneous that i only do it once it's spontaneous in in that in certain parts of the song my body would just naturally do certain things like the jumps i would do the jumps at the same time and you know just some things just felt right for that little part and without any real forethought to it it's just my body just boom and that's just because adrenaline is going and you're in the moment and that's that's why I love playing music. That's, a, that's yeah. why I really enjoy it. All right. Pleasure to talk to you, mate. Okay. Take care. You too, brother. Catch up. Bye. Right. Way too short, wasn't it? But uh, as I said in the introduction, hopefully we'll be able to reconnect sometime in the future. And there's a heap of aspects from throughout his career I want to ask him questions about. In particular, his views brought more expanded views on influences and musicianship. So there you have it. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Thanks so much for listening. Before I let you go, though, if you could stick around and have a listen to what I have to say about my book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond, go across to scarsandguitars.com, click the link in the banner, and you'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice. Download a sample, and if you do complete the purchase, hit me up because I want to thank you personally on that note here's some more stuff to share with you about the book adios amigos this is eric rattan of cannibal corpse you are listening to the scars and guitars podcast with andrew mckay smith i've been the host of the scars and guitars podcast since 2017 the first musician i interviewed for the show was david vincent from morbid angel and things have just snowballed from there in all I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the... I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton. 
gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.